Good morning, church. And welcome again to Crossway. We are super excited to be together. This is a little unusual for us this morning, okay? We don't normally meet in this close, confined quarters. We usually meet over those uh, in those uh, larger salons on the other end of the hotel. So if you come on most Sundays, this will be not where you go, okay? But we'll try to have people kind of positioned outside to, to lead you and guide you in the right direction in the future. But, you know, these are the bumps and bruises of being a new church plant, right? These are the, the fun roller coaster sort of rides where we get kind of thrown around to different rooms and things like that. So we're excited to be in here. It's kind of cool. The acoustics are awesome, I think, at least. If, if there's a silver lining uh, to being confined in here, uh, all cooped up like sardines. But anyway, um, we love you guys. We want you to know that Crossway is a family that we want to invite you to be a part of. We're not just a, a place that we want you to come on Sundays, kind of check your, uh, your religious to-do list off, you know, and, and, uh, and just kind of punch your ticket. But we want you guys to, to know that we are family. That's not just words. Uh, most of us are together throughout the week, all kinds of, uh, you know, hours of the day and night. And we truly love each other and want you to be invited into that family as well. So if you're a guest with us this morning, it's your first time or maybe second or third or fourth or 20th time. I don't know. But we're super glad you're here. And I uh, hope that you leave here blessed. But that the blessing... Uh, you know, the goal is not to just leave here blessed, but we always want you to be able to take that blessing and pass it on to somebody else as you go out from here. So hopefully uh, what we do this morning will do that. So uh, we're in a series, and it's titled Less is More. And uh, we're actually finishing the series this morning, but don't worry if this is your first one. You'll be like, oh man, I'm not going to know what's going on. It's like coming to the sequel of the movie or something, but I didn't see part one. No, it's not going to be like that, okay? So, but it is the final one in our series before we launch into our new series called Real Truth. And uh, so if you don't know about Real Truth, what that is going to be is the next Friday and Saturday, depending on if you're in the adult group or if you're in the campus ministry, I think the campus ministry is meeting on a Friday one week and a Saturday the next, and then the adults are meeting on Saturday both uh, this week and next week. And we're going to watch these, these movies, okay? And then on Sunday, we'll have a sermon that's centered on those movies. Our, our ambition, our goal is to get out into the community and go, hey, you want to come watch a movie, you know? And hopefully draw some people in, and then while they're there, be like, hey, you know, we're going to talk about this on Sunday. You should come check it out. So it's kind of a, a, a campaign, if you will, where we're, we're trying to just draw more attention to Crossway and get more people to start coming so that, not so our numbers go up and we, you know, uh, grow in, in that way, but because we really believe there are people in Columbia that need Jesus, that need God, and, um, and we want to give that to them. So um, something you'll learn about us as a church is uh, almost all of us grew up with no previous church history or background. Uh, prior to meeting someone at Crossway and being introduced to Jesus and then having our lives completely changed. So if you're here this morning, you go, oh, man, I don't know if I belong. Uh, I got some problems. I got some issues. Man, trust me, you're right at home, okay? We all got those things going on, and, uh, but we believe in a God that's big enough to get us beyond some of those things. So anyway, we're super glad you're here. Uh, before we dive into the lesson this morning, which is our final one, it's titled God's Call and My Response. I want to show you a quick video to kind of launch us into this. So I'm going to sit down and be quiet. Think God can't use you? Think he only uses perfectly qualified people? Take a closer look. Moses was not a great speaker. Jonah ran from God. Jacob was a liar. Noah got drunk. Rahab was a prostitute. David had an affair. Jeremiah was depressed. A lot. Solomon was rich in wisdom, but poor in lifestyle. John the Baptist was just plain poor. Timothy was too young. Abraham was too old. Lazarus was dead. Sarah was barren. Naomi was a widow. Spoke doubted. So did Sarah. Peter lacked self-control. 
James and John were self-righteous. Paul had a short fuse. Well, so did Peter and Moses. Actually, lots of people did. God's army isn't perfect. It never has been. It's the march of the unqualified. Get in line. All right, man. I just really like that video, and um, it's the march of the unqualified. God's got an army, and he's assembling an army, and he's trying to grow his army, but he's not looking for the most talented, the most qualified. He's looking for those that are quite the opposite. In your worship bulletin that you received when you came in this morning, hopefully you got one of those. If you open that up, there's some notes that you can pull out, some sermon notes, and you'll see some blanks that you'll be able to fill in and help you kind of follow along as we go this morning. And so the first thing you're going to see on those notes is a truth and a deduction based on that truth. And so I want to, uh, let's start with the truth. Here's a truth. In Scripture, we consistently find God calling seemingly insignificant individuals to join him in accomplishing incredibly significant things. He chooses the insignificant to accomplish the significant. Consistently. Over and over and over again. Now, my deduction based on that is this. Since God has not changed, here's my deduction. He's calling people in this generation to join him in accomplishing incredibly significant things. He wants you to do something incredibly significant in this world for him. And so you, you may come to the table and go, who, me? What do I have to offer? And he goes, yes, that's the perfect candidate. The one who doesn't have anything to offer. The one who is not super qualified. The one who's got all these problems like so many of those mighty men and women that we just listed there. You realize all of those um, are listed in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Not the hall of fame, but what we call the hall of faith. Where it's like, by faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Rahab. All this list of people that you just saw up here that were getting drunk. One of them was a prostitute. You know, they were self-righteous ones, and there were guys that had short fuses and and were quick-tempered and all these kind of things. And those are the ones he picked to do the most incredible mission that would ever be launched in this world, and that is to save humanity. Now, so if if this deduction is true, I want to give you four facts this morning that you need to face, all right? And the first one is this. Let's dive right into this. The first fact that we've got to face, if my premise is true, if my deduction is true, okay, God calls the unqualified to do really significant things, and he did it then. He hasn't changed, so he's doing it now. If that's true, we've got to face fact number one. When God calls, I and or others may be surprised that he called, all right? And I want to just go through sort of machine gun style here, some of the examples that we see in Scripture, and let you see what is said about each of these folks, and call your your attention to some of these guys. The first one is Moses. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 11, notice what it says. And this is, let me give you a little context. So Moses sees this bush on fire, and then the bush starts talking. And so Moses is like, uh, what is going on? And then the bush says, man, take your sandals off. You're on holy ground. So Moses is like, okay, I take my sandals off, you know. And then the bush starts talking, but it's not a bush talking. It's God talking through this bush. He's using this bush to get Moses' attention so he can call him. And then once God calls him, he says, I want you to go, and I want you to set my people free. I want you to go talk to the most intimidating dude on the planet, Pharaoh, and I want you to confront him, and I want you to get him to let my people go. Listen to this. It says, but Moses said to God, I'm nobody. How can I go to the king or Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And I am, I'm reminded of a phrase that I say all the time. Some of you have been around me long enough. You've heard me say this over and over and over again. But Moses, the Moses we know, Moses didn't know he was Moses. <laughs> Moses was like, you got the wrong cat. I don't speak well. 
I stutter, I stumble over my words, you've got the wrong guy. And God says, boy, this is my translation, <laughs> boy, who made your mouth? I made your mouth. I'll tell you what to say. I just need you to get up and do what I'm telling you to do, and I'll meet you there. Another one, Gideon, and we talked about him uh, just a few weeks ago. But God calls Gideon, and he says, you're a mighty warrior, Gideon. Now get up and go and fight. And Gideon said in Judges chapter 6, verse 15, listen to Gideon's attitude. Gideon said to him, me, my master, how and with what could I ever save Israel? Look at me, my clan's the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the runt of the litter. He goes, you got the wrong guy. There's some warriors here. I don't know. I'm sure when, when guy goes, hey, mighty warrior, I'm sure Gideon goes, Ain't nobody here but me. Who are you talking to, <laughs> you know? But God says, no, you're the mighty warrior. And then he tells him this famous phrase. I, I think I might want to make it into a T-shirt. It's so cool. But he goes, go in the strength you have. You ain't got much, okay, Gideon? We acknowledge that. You're kind of hiding out here in this wine press, you know. You should be out here on the front lines fighting for me and standing up for me. But you're over here hiding. But he goes, go in the strength you have. And the cool thing about God is, when he calls you, he says, go in the strength you have, which it might not be very much. But then when you get there, he meets you there and he gives you what you need. Another one is Amos, the prophet. Listen to what Amos said about himself. In Amos chapter 7, verses 14 through 15, he says, but Amos replied, I'm not a professional prophet, and I was never trained to be one. I'm just a shepherd. I take care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord called me away from my flock and told me, go and prophesy to my people in Israel. <laughs> Listen, guys, God will call you. And then you can look at yourself and you can assess and you can go, what? I, I don't talk. I'm not been, I haven't been trained in this. I, I don't know what I'm doing. I do this over here. And you could fill in the blank. You can say, I'm a computer programmer. I sit behind a computer all day. I don't stand up and talk. I don't stand up and do things like that. I haven't been trained for that. Or I don't know what your occupation is or what you do or what you feel that you're gifted at, but what if God calls you outside of what you're good at? Will we look at ourselves the way Amos does, the way Gideon, the way that Moses did? Here's another one. <laughs> and this, I told you, uh, if you noticed that, that first... Um, blank that you filled in. It says, when God calls, I and or others might be surprised. David's brother is surprised when he's called to be king, or actually, when he's, yes, when he's called to be king, but also when he's the one that's going to go fight Goliath. David's brother's like, right. Listen to what he says in 1 Samuel 17, verse 28. It says, David's oldest brother, Eliab, overheard this conversation, became angry with David. Why have you come down here? Who's watching your tiny flock? I'm your brother, and I know you. You're arrogant. Your heart's evil. You've come to watch the battle as if it was just entertainment. No, man, David was there to fight, but his brother didn't believe it. Like, I know you, you little scrawny punk. What are you doing here? You're just coming to watch while the rest of us go out here and fight? And David's like, no, that's not, that's not what's happening at all. None of y'all have been standing up to the big Philistine. I'm here to do it. And I love it, man. The, you know, I don't want to get too off topic, but I just love that it says everyone else was looking up, but David was looking down. You know what he's looking down? He said, you're an uncircumcised Philistine, meaning you're not under the covenant with God. I am, boy, and so you're in trouble, big fella. Everyone else was looking up. David was looking down. You ain't been cut. You haven't been to the doctor. I can take you out. David knew something about himself there. He knew something about his God and his power, but David had his doubters, even his own brother. 
when he was called, didn't believe. And then finally, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9. Listen to what Paul says of himself. He says, all the other apostles are greater than I am. I'm not even good enough to be called an apostle because, and notice on your notes, there should be a blank there. You can fill in the blank. I want you to sort of think the way Paul is thinking here and go, listen, I am not good enough to, and you can fill in that blank, but whatever God is calling you to, you might go, I'm not good enough to do that. And then you have a lot of reasons, a lot of becauses, right? And I want you to think about that this morning as you consider Moses, Gideon, Amos, Eliab, David's brother. And as you consider Paul, God calls you to something. Will you be surprised? Will those around you be surprised? Listen, I can't, I'll, I'll never forget when my family um, first heard me, like, preach. Like, some of my family, they would come, they heard, oh, he's going to be preaching, so they all, like, flocked there, and they're like, what is happening? I preach. We don't have preachers in our family, you know? And I'll never forget, they're like, what happened to the little boy that we knew? You know, that was so foul-mouthed and didn't know how to execute a sentence without a cuss word, every other word, you know? Like, what happened? And it's so cool to go, God called me. And I didn't feel qualified. I didn't know what I was doing. I'd never led singing in my life. I'd never spoken public in my life. The first time I did both, my voice cracked and my knees knocked and I was a mess. But he called. And so I go, all right, I think you could do better, but, you know, okay. And so here we are because he met me there. Now, to stay connected to that call, whatever it is, whatever God's call is for you, to stay connected to it, I must grasp God's strategy. There's a reason that he does it the way. There's a reason when he calls, it's a shock. It's a surprise to you and to others around you. There's a reason. It's because it's tied to his strategy. Do you know what his strategy is? Listen to this. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 26 through 30, we get a glimpse into God's thought process, into his strategy of why he operates this way. It says, look carefully at your call, brothers and sisters. By human standards, not many of you are deemed to be wise. Not many are considered powerful. Not many of you come from royalty, right? But celebrate this. God selected the world's foolish to bring shame upon those who think they're wise. Likewise, he selected the world's weak to bring disgrace upon those who think they're strong. God selected the common and the cast off, whatever lacks status, so that he could invalidate the claims of those who think those things are significant. So it makes no sense for any person to boast in God's presence. Instead, Credit God with your new situation. Isn't that cool? This is God's strategy. It's truly the march of the unqualified. God picks those that no one else picks, the ones that were the leftovers, the ones that nobody else wanted. He goes, perfect. So that he could show up and show out, and he would get the credit. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. To a messed up, you talk about a messed up church, a messed up bunch of Christians, listen to what he says to this group in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. He says, but this beautiful treasure is contained in us. We're cracked pots made of earth and clay so that the transcendent character of this power will be clearly seen as coming from God and not from us. He goes, when someone looks at you, they're going to see how jacked up, how messed up you are. They're going to see all the cracks in your little cracked pot. But the cool thing about a cracked pot is when there's something dynamic and amazing inside, a light starts shining through those cracks and bursting forth. And what does it make people do? It makes people go, what's inside there? 
They don't go, look at that messed up, cracked pot. They go, ooh, what's inside? Something's glowing, right? And that's what we want. We want to go, listen, we're broken. Here's my brokenness. Here's my cracks, man. I am messed up, but God is in me. And he's doing something amazing. And you are messed up, and he could do something amazing in you. So I want to I wanna expose my weaknesses. I want to like put them on display for people to see, but then also so they can see God transforming me from the inside out. Don't you want that? Are you tired of just the same old, same old man, the same old struggles, the same old purposelessness? Listen, without God, what, it, what are we here for? Like without God as a concept, okay, wh- what's the point? I mean, you could come up with some points. But ultimately, do you, do you feel what I'm saying? Like, you're the one coming up with the points. And your point might be different than someone else's point. So without him, what's the point? I would argue there's really not much of one. You can come up with some stuff. But at the end of the day, it's not going to really last much beyond the grave, or if, at all beyond the grave. But with God, he gives us this incredible opportunity to latch on to this power and to see our lives transformed, and to do something that's incredibly significant in this world that you never dreamed you'd ever be able to be a part of. And that's what we want to call you to. God's strategy is to show his power through cracked, messed up people. And he wants everyone to see and to know that his power is available to everyone, and there is no problem too big for this power. Because you know what kind of power it is? Resurrection power. It's the same type of power that can turn death into life. It's connected to Jesus dying and three days later coming back from the dead. Fact number two. Let's keep moving. Fact number two. When God calls, he will demand your submission. It's not a suggestion. He goes, here's the call. This is what I want you to do. And there is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. He demands that you submit. Now, you can reject that. that. That's not going to end well, but you can reject that. But he demands submission. Listen, submission is a bad word in our culture today. Man, you talk about, like, you get to those passages about wives submit to your husbands, and then, like, the world is like, what did you say? (laughs) You know, it's like, submit, what do you mean? And, by the way, wives are not the only ones that are called to submit in that passage. It's like, We're all called to submit to each other. So it's not a bad word, okay? The world has made it a bad word because we want to be our own bosses and we want to be in control and we want to rule our own lives. And God is like, how's that been working out for you? It doesn't really work out when you do it your way. It's pretty clear. Look at the world you live in and how jacked up it is, how cracked it is. Don't you want some power inside there to make the cracks worthwhile? Fact number two, when God calls, he demands my submission. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 13 through 14. It says, the Lord will make you like the head and not like the tail. You'll be on top and not on bottom. But, that sounds good, doesn't it? But here's the big old but. But you must obey the commands of the Lord your God that I'm giving you today. Be careful to keep them. Do not disobey anything I command you today. You see, a lot of us want God's blessing. We want him to put us on top, give us that promotion, whatever it is. We want to be at the head, not the tail. We want to be in the front, not the back. We want his blessing, but a lot of us aren't too concerned about letting him be Lord and obeying him. See, it's one thing to call him Lord, It's another thing to let him be Lord. A lot of people today, I think, want him as Savior, but don't want him as Lord. And the problem is, you can't separate those two concepts. He's Lord and Savior, or he's not Savior at all. It doesn't mean we're perfect, but it means we are in a posture of surrender and constantly going, God, 
I messed up, and I picked myself up, but I'm submitting to you. I'm surrendered. I'm sorry. It's like, it's not this posture of perfection, like we just obey perfectly all the time. That's not the picture, but it's a picture of surrender to the king, that I never buck up and go, nope, I'm doing it my way. But Lord, I did it my way, and I shouldn't have, and I'm sorry, and, and I just have that posture of surrender. You know, um, he demands submission. We see it in the life of Jonah. Some of you are familiar with the story of Jonah. Jonah is this prophet who God calls, and he says, I want you to go to this city called Nineveh, and I want you to preach to the city. I want you to preach against it. I want you to, to tell it that it's going to hell in a handbasket, okay, so to speak. But Jonah doesn't want to, and so he runs really, really far in the opposite direction of where God is calling him. But God demands submission, right? So what did he do to Jonah? He sent a fish, a really big fish, some kind of fish. We don't know what kind of fish. Maybe it's extinct. Maybe it's still around. I don't know. But he swallowed Jonah and took him back the direction he was supposed to go and spit him out. God demands submission. Now, you don't want to go through the misery of being in the belly of a fish for three days. I don't know what that might equate to, okay, metaphorically, okay, for you. But you don't, you, you don't have to learn the hard way. You can just hear God's call and go, okay, I don't see how this is going to work out, but all right, I can't wait to see what, how you're going to show up, God, because if you don't, I'm just going to make a fool of myself. But you go anyway. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 through 9, Listen to these words. That's why the Holy Spirit says, today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled, when they tested me in the wilderness. There your ancestors tested and tried my patience, even though they saw my miracles for 40 years. You know, for 40 years they wandered around this wilderness, but they were completely taken care of. God gave them quail at night. Y'all ever eat quail? That's some good eating, man. They complained about the quail. Who complains about quail? Have you ever ate quail? Raise your hand if you had quail. If you didn't raise your hand, slap yourself and go eat some quail. It's delicious. All right? It's amazing. And then they had heavenly wafer stuff that came down from heaven. Like, and like, it's delicious. And they're like, man, we're tired of this food. We want the food back in Egypt where we were slaves. And this was... Not too different than us. And he goes, today when you hear his call, even if it's, hey, go wander around the wilderness and eat quail and wafers that you might get tired of or whatever, he goes, don't harden your hearts like they did. You know what it means to harden your heart? It means nothing. Uh, the King James would say a calloused heart. You ever had a callous on your hand? What is it? It's like dead skin or something that just kind of keeps getting harder and harder and harder. And then you lose sensitivity in it. You can't feel anymore right there in that spot and nothing can penetrate it. And that's what he's saying. Don't get a calloused heart. Don't get a hard heart where God's word and God's call can't, you know, penetrate and pierce and prick your heart and, and make you and motivate you to want to do something different. Don't harden your hearts, but submit. To stay connected to the call, here's another thing you got to do. You got to determine to obey God. So submission and obedience are kind of really interconnected, but listen to what Joshua says here about just determining that I'm going to obey. It's a famous passage. It's like a refrigerator magnet for a lot of people or a bumper sticker. Okay, this is one of the most well-known verses, you know, but let's read it. In Joshua 24, 15, it says, But if you are unwilling to obey the Lord, then decide today whom you will obey. Will it be the gods of your ancestors beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites here in this land? But as for me, Joshua says, but as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. He was determined to obey the Lord, the one true God. Now, many don't realize that if you're not obeying, and we see this in this passage, just kind of look at this passage as I talk about it and see if you don't see this. But many don't realize that if you're not obeying and serving the one true God, you're still obeying and serving someone or something. Maybe yourself. 
maybe a spouse, maybe a boyfriend or girlfriend, maybe your work, but somewhere, something, you're, you're following and serving and obeying something. And so he's basically saying, look, if serving God is not desirable, then you might as well decide who you're going to serve because you're going to serve and obey something. But he says, but as for me, when I look at those choices, me and my family, we're serving the Lord. And Joshua said, I'm going to be a leader in my household. Me and my wife and my kids, this is our direction. Men, we're really failing in that area, you know. A lot of men are failing in that area. I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I've done a lot of reading on this, but, you know, I think the church, uh, something we were talking about as our, in our men's group here recently this past Saturday, we were talking about how the church in a lot of ways has been sort of um, more geared toward women. And uh, so by and large across the board, in, in this country at least, um, church attendance is dominated by women, and men are just content to sleep and not come. And a lot of that, you know, is on the guy. They need to, you know, get their straw and suck it up or whatever. And, you know, I get all that. But there's, there's also another side of that coin where it's like, what are we calling men to come to? Let's, let's call them to come and, and, and engage in these emotional kind of songs and stuff. And guys, you know, are kind of weak in that area anyway. It's like, and then, are we, but, you know, men are wired. And the book we were reading is like men are wired to rule. They want to conquer. And it's why little boys, when they're young, they pick up a stick, and it's not like a it's not like a a, a ballerina. It's a gun, right? It's like they want to go conquer. And they want to do things, and so they come to church and they're like, "There's no room for me to conquer. There's no room for me to be a man," you know. And it's like, so I don't want us to be that way. I want us to be a place where men and women alike can, can come and feel like this is a place I want to be. This is a place where I come and I grow and I benefit and I build relationships and a difference is being made in my life and I'm making a difference in other people's lives. But guys, it's a determination. I got a little sidetracked. I get fired up by some of this stuff. But Joshua goes, this is what I'm going to do. And this is what my family's going to do. And he led in that direction. He determined to obey God. Let me give you fact number three. When God calls, I must be willing to sacrifice. That's another word that nobody likes. <laughs> yeah, right? And, and I want to talk about this, but, but I thought, what better place in our assembly time than here to talk about sacrifice than to take a little bit of time and break off for a second and take of the Lord's Supper? Because that's what this is really all about. If you notice in your chair, hopefully somewhere near you, you can find one of these little cups. Uh, and we call this the rip and sip, okay? There's a little clear, uh, and these are COVID safe. That's why we're using them. By the way, we're looking to change that soon, hopefully, and we'll have an option where you can stay COVID safe if you want to, or you can have some homemade bread that doesn't taste like styrofoam. So, all right. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I apologize about the taste of all this, but it's not about that because this this is unleavened bread that represents an uncontaminated, without yeast, without sin, the sinless Son of God and His body that was broken and put on a cross for all of our sins. And the juice in this cup represents His blood that was shed there. The blood of the covenant, the relationship, the thing that makes it possible to have a relationship with God. And so we take this every week at Crossway because we think, man, we don't need to go much more than a week without remembering the sacrifice of Jesus so that it calls us to be sacrificial. So let's pause for a second. Our worship team is going to sing a song as you just take your time, pray to God, um, and just, just take of these emblems at your own pace as we sing the song. But I'm going to say a prayer, and then our worship team is going to lead us in that. So, Father God, thank you for your sacrifice. Um, when we want a definition of sacrifice, we need look no further than the cross. God, Jesus took our place. It was our sin that put him there. We paid the, we, we did the crime, but he paid the fine. He took the punishment on himself. There is no greater sacrifice than to lay down your life for your friends. Thank you for considering us friends, for considering us worthy worth enough to send your only son to die 
So as we take these emblems, God, help us remember your great love, your great sacrifice, and I pray in Jesus' name, amen. never um, ceases to amaze me how consumed as Americans kind of if I could pick pick on us for a second (laughs) but I've been a lot of places in the world and I just think that we're the worst (laughs) In, in this aspect okay but it never ceases to amaze me how consumed we are with comfort and convenience and how much we will spend in order to have it, and how much we will, the links that we will go to make sure it's not interfered with. When God calls us to do something, it is almost always inconvenient, uncomfortable, and it requires sacrifice. And so, what does that mean then? If we're so consumed with the, the very thing that God goes, when I call you, you're going to have to get uncomfortable, you're going to have to sacrifice, you're going to you know, have to completely get outside of what you're normally consumed with protecting. What does that say about us? That we've got some work to do. That this isn't going to come natural. Every fiber of our being says, no, fight for your comfort and your convenience. But God goes, but I'm calling you to something, and it's going to require you to let go of those things. You remember the story of Esther? For those of you who don't know, it was a young lady named Esther who becomes queen. And it's King Xerxes that chooses her as queen. And, and during that time, while she's queen, 
the Jews, her people, are being threatened by King Xerxes, one of his officials actually named Haman, one of his royal officials. But he's backed by the king, this Haman guy. And he's got this edict out to just hunt down and, and take out the Jews. And he's got this plan to go and take out this, uh, one of the Jews' leaders named Mordecai, who happens to be Queen Esther's uncle. And so Mordecai comes secretly to Esther, and he meets with her, and he pleads with Esther to speak to the king on their behalf. And it's, for, it's forbidden by law. You don't approach the king uninvited, and if you do, the punishment is death. But Esther hears the call of God, and she says these words in Esther chapter 4, verse 16. Think about sacrifice. When God calls, i got to be willing to sacrifice. Esther was. Listen to what she says. She says, then I will go in to see the king, even if it means I must die. She answered the call. She didn't know what was going to happen when she approached Xerxes uninvited. She knew what was, by law, should happen. She put her life on the line to answer God's call. What are you willing to sacrifice to answer God's call? Listen to the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul says this, I don't care, in, in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, he says, I don't care about my own life. The most important thing is that I complete my mission the work that the Lord Jesus gave me. And he would go on there, if you read the rest of that, you see the dot, 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 he would go on to say that that was proclaiming the good news about Jesus dying, being buried, and resurrecting from the dead. He said, that's the most important thing. Even if it means you're going to kill me because I say it, make my day, because I am talking about the resurrected king, okay, and he's going to resurrect me, so I don't have to worry about you. And so he says, my life is not that important. The most important thing is Christ and his message. Paul would say in Philippians, to live is Christ and to die is what? Say it loud. Gain. To live is Christ, to die is gain. There's a really cool commentary on this by a man named Gordon Fee. He wrote this commentary on this passage, and he said, too often for us, it is for me to live as Christ, plus other pursuits. Work, leisure, accumulating wealth, relationships, etc. And if the truth were known, Fee says, all too often the plus factor has actually become our primary passion. So for to me, for so it changes from for me to live as Christ to for me to live as work, or you fill in the blank. This is the battle of selfishness, and it, it must be won. The problem with living sacrifices, you know, Paul says that we're called to be these living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. The problem with living sacrifices is they crawl off the altar. They decide not to be sacrificial. They decide not to sacrifice. But can I tell you that God will not show up to an empty altar. If there's no sacrifice, don't expect him to show up with his amazing power. Fill in another blank for you. To stay connected to the call, I must do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. In Mark chapter 8, we hear Jesus saying this in verses 34 through 35. If people want to follow me, Jesus says, they must give up the things they want. They must be willing even to give up their lives to follow me. Those who want to save their lives will give up true life. But those who give up their lives for me and for the good news will have true life. See, some of us, we want Jesus, right? We want all the blessings. We want him to save us. We want all these things. But we want to hang on to certain things in our life that he says you got to let go of. And so here he goes, you try to save your life and hang on to those things, you're going to lose true life. 
You can't ride the fence, is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, we must be willing to do whatever it takes, to let go of whatever it takes, to, to give up whatever it takes, to do whatever it takes. In Hebrews chapter 11, after he goes through the hall of faith and lists all these men, listen to what he says about some unnamed people. Remember we talked about an unnamed uh, person last week out of this text that was actually right before this in verse 34. But we're going to pick up in verse 35 and read through 38 here in Hebrews 11. It says, others, all right, we talked about this hall of faith, but others were tortured and refused to accept their freedom so that they could be raised from the dead to a better life. Some were laughed at and beaten. Others were put in chains and thrown into prison. They were stoned to death. They were cut in half, and they were killed with swords. Some wore the skins of sheep and goats. They were poor, abused, and treated badly. But listen to what it says about them. The world was not good enough for them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes in the earth. You ready to go live in a hole in the earth for the sake of God and his kingdom and his message? You know, some of us don't even want to, you know, do without air conditioning for a little while. You know what I'm saying? Some of us don't like being in this little room cooped up. Some of us don't like it when a classmate in high school or in college or something makes fun of you or laughs at you. It says these men were laughed at. But they, they were like cut in half. I mean, can you imagine that? Like because you speak up for God that someone would go, okay, line him up. We're going to cut him in half. Are you willing to do whatever it takes? Here's the thing, guys. So... I know brothers and sisters in other parts of the world right now, presently, that are being drugged out of their houses, like, and they have to hide, and they have to have their secret meetings. The underground church is a real thing. I've been a part of it. I've been in, I've been in apartment complexes where we had Bible studies in sort of secret where they bugged the apartment. And we had to speak in code. If we wanted to talk about baptizing someone, we would talk about having taken a bath. Right? We had to speak in code. Here, we're just, I mean, we're singing in the middle of a hotel, probably waking up everybody this morning when we were practicing at 730, you know? But it's all good. <laughs> I mean, but we're not at risk. And we still have a hard time. I read uh, uh, there was a missionary that came over here, and she was, they, they decided to move from, I think it was Vietnam. No, I think it was uh, Korea. It was Korea. And they had been in North Korea, but then they had escaped to South Korea. It's very dangerous for Christians in North Korea. But she came, she and her family came here and started participating in church, and it was like a pretty uh, well-known, well-to-do church that's, that, you know, was kind of moving and shaking and doing some things, you know, have a lot of influence and a lot of uh, clout, I guess, if you will, in the religious world. So they were part of this church. But after about a month of being here, she goes to her husband, and she says, I want to go back home. He said, why? And she said, the church here is sleepy. That was her words. I think she was struggling for the right English word, Right? She said, the church here is sleepy. They've lost sight. I mean, they, they don't understand. They've got all the ability in the world and all the freedom in the world to go out and just turn the world upside down, and yet they're sleepy. They're not doing anything. Guys, we don't want to be that kind of church. Why, why, do, you plant, why do you think we planted a church in Columbia? You think there's not enough here? There's a reason. Listen, there's a reason I moved from Alabama to come to Missouri to help plant a church in Columbia. It's not because I didn't have a nice, cushy sort of position there in Alabama. I did. I was very well supported and was a campus minister working with college students, which I love, like all the time, staying up late, eating pizza and doing all this crazy stuff. It was awesome. We had like 100 students coming and stuff, and it was, it was amazing. But I came here because I saw something that was happening that I think has the potential to start changing the temperature 
in our country, for the church. There's too many sleepy churches. There's too many churches that are just focused on putting on a good show but have no relational connections with people. They're not dealing with real-life issues and helping people overcome. They're, they're attracting other religious people from other churches because we have a better show than you do, and that's not what we want to be. Do we want to sing well? Yeah, we, we practice and we try to do a good job so that we don't get in the way, but it's not to put on a show. It's to help people engage. And, and guys, what we do here on Sunday morning is it's just a fraction of what we do as Crossway as a family. And we want to invite you, man, to be a part of that, to see, your, to see God do awesome things in your life and to go out and help us. Like, join with us and help us go rescue Columbia. I'm not talking about going out and attracting more religious people and convincing them that we're the better church. That's the last thing that we want. We want to find people that are afraid if they walk through that door that the walls will cave in. That's who we want to find. That's why we want to grow. Because the more unqualified soldiers we got, the more opportunity we have to go share the good news with people. All right, let me find my place. <laughs> All right, fact number four. Let's finish this thing up. Fact number four. When I answer the call... God supplies the power. So many are afraid to answer God's call, and the number one reason is because they don't think they have enough power to accomplish the call. But God supplies the power. God will not call you to do something that he is unwilling to empower you to accomplish. Our problem is an issue of self-reliance and independence, and it's a lack of trust. And the battle over this has to be won. We've got to believe that if he calls us, that he will meet us there and empower us to do what he called us to do. But we've got to trust that. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, Paul is trying to convince a church in Ephesus of this very thing that I'm trying to convince you of this morning. He says, never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all of this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all, for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. I love the passion translation there. It's very passionate, <laughs> right? It's a, I love the words there. His miraculous power, right, constantly energizes you, and it meets you there where you're weak. You know, I, I've said this, but 25 of us moved out here to Columbia, left jobs, left homes, sold properties, did all these things to come to Columbia, separated from our family in Wentzville, where we, where we were training and putting this team together, separated from them, um, and here we are. And we're not like special people, but we're just people that at some point in time were introduced to Jesus surrendered to him as king, and then saw his power change us. Now, we're still all works in progress, all right? For sure. <laughs> but we consistently call each other to tap into that power. And we never settle for where we're at, and we want to always get better so that we can better serve others. You can overcome sins, you can overcome strongholds that have been a part of your life for years. You can. Not because you're so cool. Not because we're so cool. And we're like the best counselors in the world or something. That's not why. It's because of his mighty power. And there's nothing too great or insurmountable for the resurrection power that we have at our disposal. The psalmist says in Psalm 18, 29, In your strength, circle that on your notes, circle your strength, in your strength, I can crush an army. With my God, circle that, with my God, I can scale any wall. With your strength, I can crush an army. And with you, God, with your power, I can scale any wall. See, this is a battle of faith and doubt. And it's got to be won. Answering God's call always has more to do with the I am than who I am. 
Write that down. Answering God's call always has more to do with the I am than who I am. The I am, of course, is what we know to be the way God refers to himself. The I am. I am that I am. The uncreated one. So why? Let's end here. Why should we answer the call? I want to give you one negative reason and one positive reason. The first one is there is a price to be paid if you don't answer the call. There is a price to be paid. Back to the story of Esther. By the way, often you pay the price and so do the people around you that you're connected with. You'll see that theme throughout Scripture. You answer the call, or if you don't answer the call, there's a price to be paid. Listen to what happened to, in the story of Esther in, in chapter 4, verse 14, the first part of that verse. It says, if you don't speak up now, Esther, you and your family will be killed. Not only will you die, Esther, but also your family. And this is when she decides, I'm going to go talk to the king, even if it means I might die. Here's the second reason that we need to answer God's call. Because there is a reward to be received if I do. Also, in that latter part of the verse there in Esther 4, 14b, it says, it could be, this is Mordecai talking to her, it says, it could be that you were made queen for a time like this. What a phrase. It could be that you showed up this morning at Crossway Church for such a time as this. Because maybe God's been calling you for a while, <laughs> and you've just been putting him on the back burner or kind of drowning him out with some other stuff, right? <laughs> like, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to have to deal with that, so I'm just going to be over here. You can do that by distancing yourself from your own brothers and sisters at church. You can do that by putting, surrounding yourself with other things and just... Lots and lots of activity and busyness. By the way, you know what the word busy stands for? B-U-S-Y? Being under Satan's yoke. You want to be a slave to the enemy? <laughs> then busy yourself so much that you got no time for God. You got no time for his people. You got no time to study his word. And then you'll stay right where you are. You'll suffer. You'll pay the price. And so will others around you. But there's a reward if you answer the call. The end of the story of Esther... This is not on your notes, but it'll be on the screen. In Esther 8, notice what happens here. After she answers the call, the king doesn't kill her. The king is sympathetic, and he says, Okay, Esther, whatever you want, bring Mordecai in, and I'm going to give him a ring. I'm going to put a robe on him. I'm going to put him in charge. You know, Mordecai ends up being second in command. The only one more powerful is Xerxes himself in the whole land. And then the Jews are not threatened any longer. The edict is removed. Haman, by the way, the one that was going to kill the Jews, is hanged, and he's put to death. And Mordecai gets a robe. Listen to this at the end of all this. Mordecai left the king's presence wearing royal clothes of blue and white and a large gold crown. He also had a purple robe made of the best linen, and the people of Susa shouted for joy. It was a time of happiness, joy, gladness, and honor for the Jewish people. As the king's order went out to every state and city, there was joy and gladness among the Jewish people. In every state and city to which the king's order went, they were having feasts and celebrating. And it even goes on to say, and some people wanted to become Jews. God's universal call now, he's got individual calls, okay? He's calling some of you to some very specific things, but I want, to, I want to call your attention to one this morning that you have an instant opportunity to respond to, and it's God's universal call to everyone on the planet, and that is to come to him. Come to him as you are. You don't have to get cleaned up to come to him. His message is two things, repent and be baptized. What does that mean? Repent is, Greek word is metanoia. It literally means, if you translated it, we have a transliteration of the word, hence the word repent. Um, long story, I'll tell you some other time. But the literal translation, you go to the Greek word and go to get you a Greek dictionary, metanoia literally means to change your mind. That's what it means. He says, change your mind. About what? 
about whether you like chocolate cake or not? No. Change your mind about who's going to be in charge in your life. That's what repent means. Change your mind and let Jesus be in control. And then he says, be baptized. Not clean yourself up, but come to get clean. So he says, change your mind and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, that amazing power that shines through the cracks. He says, this promise is for you, your children, and all who are far off, all whom the Lord our God will call. Acts chapter 2, 36 through 38. So I want to invite you to respond. Your first opportunity to do that, if you open up your worship bulletin, you'll see a cardstock piece of paper. You can take that out. And on it, there's a lot of opportunities for you to respond to the Word of God this morning. You can check some boxes. You can say, listen, I'll, I'll, I've got some questions. I want to study the Bible. I want to ask some questions about what I heard this morning. You can write prayer requests out to the side. You can say, I want a personal Bible study. You can say, I want to be baptized. You can say, I want to know what it means to be a part of this church. How do I become a member? You can put anything in everything. And if you don't see a category and you got something else, write it somewhere on there, okay? But members and guests alike, please fill that out. Um, we promise we won't like spam you or do anything weird, okay? We just want to get to know you and, and have an opportunity for you um, to respond to what you heard this morning. So I'm going to pray, and then our worship team is going to sing a couple songs, um, and I'll give you a couple more instructions here in just a bit. Father God, thank you uh, for your word. Thank you for the message. And um, I just pray, Father, that it not just be words that go in one ear and out the other, I pray that for myself. I know as I was preparing to preach this, I, I know that um, I was convicted, and I want, to be, I want to be better. I want to submit to you more. I want to sacrifice more. I want to, to listen to your call, both the general call but also specific things. So, God, this morning, I pray that you work in the hearts and minds of the people here. Help them to just help my words sort of fade into the distance, but your words to be prominent in, in the foreground of their minds and hearts, and for that to make a difference, God. I pray that they'll give you a chance this morning. Help them to think. Help them to write. Help them to act. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.